wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Leah Follett. Welcome to A Quirky Journey. Join us as we share our family's journeys to good health. You'll find plenty of inspiration, tips and recipe ideas, as well as stories from everyday people who've struggled and overcome health problems and diet challenges in their own families. I'm Jo Witten, author of the blog and book Quirky Cooking, and today I'm here with Jenny Tishi, who is a nutritionist in the UK, a good friend of mine. And Anne Gary on the Health Show. And this is a radio program in Marlow, UK, that I was lucky enough to be interviewed on while I was in the UK. Totally enjoyed it. And I thought I'd share it with my listeners because I think there's a lot of um, bits and pieces in here that you'll find helpful. So I hope you enjoy it. And thank you to Marlow FM for allowing us to share it. And you're listening to Anne Gary in the Health Show. And um, I hope all our listeners are ex- excited as I am um, to have the lovely Joe Witten with us in the studio. So let's just tell everybody who you are. So, Joe, introduce yourself. Let them know who okay. you are and what, you, what, what you're doing here. Okay. Um, so, I'm from Australia, obviously. And I'm over here at the moment. Um, traveling around and sharing my story and my unique cooking style (laughs) with some classes and seminars all about healthy eating, allergy-friendly cooking, getting back to basics, getting your family on board with eating this way. Um, I find a lot of people are very overwhelmed when they have to change their diet and I specialize in helping people get started and get going with um, changing the way that their family eats. And a lot of people that Um, A lot of my readers and followers are people who do have major allergies and intolerances, but then a lot of them are also just people that want to eat healthy, delicious food, um, want to improve the way that they eat and just get back to real food. Fantastic. So uh, what I what has particularly impressed me, um, you know, about your your approach is that it's not sort of, um, you know, oh dear, yes, you've you've got some difficulties and health issues and let's try and find, you know, kind of a way of you surviving. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's more about actually this is fun, this is yeah, delicious, this is using yeah. fabulous food as we need to use it and actually it's no... It's not a hardship to have to eat this way. That's the great thing, isn't it? It's like finding a whole new way of eating that there's... I find a lot of people get stuck in a rut with their eating. Mm. And they just... For years, they've lived on roast dinners and sandwiches and takeaway and it's really boring, you know, sausages and mash Mm. or whatever. And when they start trying some new ingredients and some new ways of cooking, they just, they feel like they've revolutionised the way that they cook and Mm. they're so excited. Mm. Um, And it doesn't have to be boring to be healthy. That's one of my main messages. Neither does it have to be weird and wacky either. And I know you call yourself quirky cooking, (laughs) but it doesn't have to be, um, you know, totally tofu no. kind of kebabs or no, something does right. it no. mm. yeah okay so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um so how did it all start for you I'd love to know okay. how it all got started um growing up I was raised eating whole foods. Um, My mum cooked most things from scratch. We didn't have the whole um, takeaway and bought pizza from a box and Mm. um, frozen meals and bought biscuits and bought even box cereal we didn't really have when I was growing up. It was all homemade, homemade breads, really fresh produce. We live in far north Queensland and we have the most gorgeous, you know, tropical fruits and beautiful veggies and reef fish and all of that. And so that's, I grew up eating that way and it wasn't because mum was trying to be trendy or um, it probably wasn't trendy then was it it wasn't it was because we didn't have a lot of money and mum stuck to the basics and we went to the markets and got what was cheap and in season we grew things in our backyard our next door neighbors had a trawler and we'd buy fish in bulk so that's how we lived and we learned to cook with what ingredients we had Um, it wasn't so much get a recipe go to the shop buy all these expensive ingredients cook it it was 
what have we got? What's cheap? What's in season? What's in the garden? What have people given us? Now, what can we make with it? Mm. So that was really good training for me. And growing up, I was in the kitchen a lot um, and mum encouraged us to experiment with food. And um, so I learned to do all that. But despite all that, I had um, a lot of trouble with sinuses and hay fever and headaches and sore tummy. And we couldn't really figure out what it was. And back then, the food intolerance thing wasn't so well known, at least not in my family. And um, I was kind of the odd one out. My sister used to say, I pity the man you marry, you're always sneezing. (laughs) I was like a pain in the neck because I was always having hay fever and sneezing. And so I was always taking antihistamines and stuff. And I thought, that's just me. There's nothing I can do about it. I'll always be like this. And um, And where are you in the family? I'm the second. Second, yeah. Yeah, So that was my big sister. Mm. Maybe she's listening. <laughs> no, um, so we went off. I went off to uni, and um, it seemed to get worse. And you know, nineteen years old, you know the hormones and this, the acne, and I was having a lot of trouble with all of that kind of thing. So I started going to a nutritionist and um, started trying to work on my diet. And I've started to realise that dairy was bothering me, so mm. I started to cut that back. Um, didn't have a whole lot of success because I didn't realise then that it was also gut issues and other things. Um, so when I was a bit older, I married four kids, um, I just started realising that my kids were having the same sort of problems and that I needed to do something drastic about it. So I started going to a naturopath and getting, you know, did the whole food diary thing, which is very scary if you've never done that. Mm. You know, <laughs> it's quite confronting. Writing down everything that oh, goes in your my mouth. Goodness, it's like did I really eat that much bread in one day? Um, Because it's just so hard when you've got little kids, you're busy, you're exhausted, you just eat whatever's easy and you think you're eating healthy, but you're really not. And I wasn't getting enough nutrition. The the foods that I was eating weren't nutrient dense. I had a little bit of veggies and meat, but it was a lot of bread and fillers and things because they were quick and easy and cheap. Had you continued your own family thing of kind of making a lot of the stuff yourself? Yes, And so I thought I was doing well because I was grinding the grain myself with a stone grinder. I was making the bread myself. Wow. I was making lasagna with spinach in it. I was doing all these things and I was thinking I was doing the right thing, but it, the food didn't suit me. It, I, I actually got down to 42 kilos. I was really not getting the nourishment I needed. Mm. Headaches and exhaustion and low blood pressure and low blood sugar and everything. And so um, once I went to the naturopath, we started working out what foods were bothering me and he talked to me about gut health. This was like 12 years ago maybe um, and he really um, explained to me about um, how your f- different foods affect the gut and how mm. that affects your allergy symptoms and all of this kind of thing. It was all very new to me and I remember he said things like um, you need to cut out the gluten and try and have some gluten free breads and gluten free meals and, and I was like okay but if I make bread can I add some of that gluten powder to it to make it rise better he's like no no (laughs) I was totally clueless um so I started cutting back on things like dairy and gluten and sugars and upping the vegetables and trying to do better with all of that sort of thing getting rid of the preservatives and additives and any little you know the packets had Mm. crept in a little bit as they do and the sugars and I didn't realize how much sugar I was having it was pretty exorbitant um And within two weeks, I was already seeing an improvement. My blood sugar levels were better. My headaches went away. Um, Within a month, um, I was surprised to realise I hadn't had a cold all month, which I always had a cold every month. Right. Um, And it just slowly got better. And then I I went completely off gluten and dairy and sugar, mostly most of sugars, um, for a whole month. And all my allergy symptoms went away. And that had never happened in my life. So I was like, okay, there's something in this. Um, And so just bit by bit over the years, I started tweaking the way that we ate, changing recipes to suit our family um, so that we wouldn't have these reactions. And little by little, um, just, yeah, the way that we ate totally changed Mm. over the last 10 years. And so what, how, what, how old were your children at this point? They were quite so, little. Yeah, they were yeah. quite little. When I started all this, uh, my youngest was one. So one, three, five, seven. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got four kids. And um, I think we really did notice a difference. But then fast forward mm. a few years, you know, the kids are now 17, 15, 13, 11. And, you know, when kids are this age, they're out and about a lot. They're at friends' houses. They're coming and going. They're eating more away from home. Mm. And it got harder to control what they were eating, I guess you'd say. And you got a bit, you know, oh, they seem to be doing fine. 
got a bit slack, you know. Yeah. At home, we mostly ate like that, but when they were out, they might not, or they might have a, you know, a hot, a, a cream bun or something like mm. that, you know, and they started having some things that really didn't um, go well with their bodies. Mm. And my 13-year-old especially has always been very much like me with, um, you know, not handling dairy well. And he was sort of, you know, eating a lot more things that he shouldn't. And we had some major health issues in the last year. So we've had to completely change our diet again. Right. Um, so, it, you know, you think that you think you're going well, but you constantly have to be on top of it, listening to your body, making sure that you're um, eating foods that suit you and not, yeah. not getting too slack. I mean, I know you've got to have a balance and be a bit flexible, especially when you're out and about. But um, with kids and with adults that have gut issues, you've really got to be careful. And we, yeah, got too slack. My son had major reactions. Um, middle of last year, he came down with really severe depression. Wow. Shall we... Um, I, I, yeah. I've, I'm really interested to know sort of how this all transpires and, and what, what we can learn from it in terms of applying it to, you know, other people that might be listening yeah. as well and just seeing how, you know, how generally it can be applied, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some of the key lessons. So let's just uh, play some music and we'll come back. I'm really interested okay. to know more about that. Hold on one second. And you're listening to uh, The Health Show. And hello, Sheila. Good morning, Anne. It's morning. lovely to be here, but it's going to be very short and sweet because I'm going to bail, I'm afraid. That's OK. No worries. Do you know what you're doing next week? Um, maybe talking about the new NHS uh, proposal, the five-year looking forward, where they plan by 2020 to have physical and mental health on an equitable level in ah. terms of funding and provision. So I'm trying to get a guest in to come and talk about that. Someone from the NHS? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Doubtful. <laughs> yes, I can't imagine we'd get that. I think the BBC struggled to do that. Don't they? Yeah. But yeah. Um, before I go, I just want to give a shout out to somebody who I know is listening to, to Dominic and uh, I'll see you later. Okay. All right, Sheila. Thanks very much and uh, we'll see you next week. So we're talking um, to quirky, the quirky cook, Joe. Do you mind being called the quirky fine, cook? Fine. <laughs> quirky is a nice name, actually, because yeah. it kind of gives it, makes it lighthearted. That's right. Um, and fun, doesn't yeah. it? Rather than something kind of overly kind of serious yeah, so that's, right. that's me yeah not too serious <laughs> <laughs> but with a serious sort of uh, entry point into this and yeah. sort of introduction to it so let's just finish the story you were talking about your um uh, how you you know you felt like you'd got your family on an even keel mm -hmm. and you were eating in a certain way, which I guess was different yes. to most people. Most people, yeah. but it, which you, is where I got the quirky from because I used to get called. Ah, uh, did a you? Bit quirky. Did you? That's funny, <laughs> but but there's no place for complacency, so no, things right. kind of blew up a bit last year. And yeah. tell us tell us the story. So it's your second second child, my third child. third child, yeah. Isaac, who's 13 now. Um, when he was 11, it actually started. We started having a few um, strange episodes of panic and depression and phobias. And I couldn't figure out what in the world it was because it's very out of character and also very... Um, it didn't make any sense. Mm. Um, and I sort of, you know counselled him myself through that, held him on my lap constantly while I wrote my cookbook. Um, he was always clinging to me and I homeschool the kids. So it was, thankfully, he could always be there by my side because he got to the stage where he couldn't do his schoolwork or anything. So hold on a minute. You homeschooled all your children yeah. whilst this is all <laughs> happening and you write a cookbook all at the same time? Yeah. I'm a bit okay. mad. She's an amazing artist as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. She's one of those people. Yes. <laughs> Are you, with, with people like that, sometimes you, you're sort of looking for something that isn't quite so good, so you can yeah. feel okay oh, about it. I haven't it, found it yet. No, no. Sure, I'm sure there's plenty if you look hard. <laughs> uh, okay, but, sorry um, to interrupt, Joe. No, Joe. that's okay. Um, we sort of got through that by, again, pulling back on the diet, mm. making um, some changes, because I knew what I needed to do for him to have a really healthy gut, and I knew that gut health and brain health are connected. Sure. So I pulled back on things that were affecting him and he got better again within a couple of weeks and so we continued on and you know over a couple of years things slowly got mm. slacker again because everything's fine everything's mm. fine a little you know 80 20 rule you know yes. a bit of good and a bit of bad it's no no worries and um suddenly july last year june july he just 
got hit with major depression and it was very crazy. It was, um, it got to the stage where he couldn't feed himself. I had to feed him. It took me about an hour every day, every meal oh, to wow. feed him. And if the, like, if the spoon touched his teeth, he'd fling it away. It was like, um, he had a phobia of anything clacking against his teeth. He had phobias of like claustrophobia, anything like covers mm-hmm. on him or shirts or anything. He'd be trying to pull them away and um, he couldn't get in bed and get in the car and put a seatbelt on and put his clothes on and have a bath. It was totally like um, incapacitated mm-hmm. and none of the family were coping. The kids were really stressed and we didn't know what to do. He couldn't do his schoolwork or anything um, and just cried all the time. Mm-hmm. And all I could think of was it's got to be related to the gut. There's got to be... I know that there is a connection with the gut and the brain and there's something going on that's not usual here. And I had heard a lot about the GAPS diet. Mm, Natasha Natasha Campbell McBride. Yeah, Natasha Campbell McBride, so gut and psychology syndrome. And so I started to look into that and I rang a friend of mine who's a nutritionist and chef in Australia and I said, do you think we should do this diet? And she's very balanced and she's... I told her all what was happening and she said, yes, definitely, you need to do that diet. And her... Her recommendation was also that we needed to do it with all the kids because when I started explaining other symptoms that the other kids had also, she was like, you guys have all got gut issues. You've got to do something about it. And so being who I am, I just jump in both feet and say, right, tomorrow we're starting GAPS. And if anyone knows anything about GAPS, it's kind of overwhelming. <laughs> yes, yeah. At yeah. the start. So we jumped in and then got about a week in and I just went, oh, this is a lot harder than I thought. And we've got to go to a wedding. And we've got to go to a camp and we've got to go here and we've got to go there. So I had to pull back a bit and um, we ended up starting slowly and building our way up to the really strict. Intro what diet. were the biggest uh, things that, the biggest changes you felt that you had to make? What um, were the. Coming the, off so much fruit and sugars. We yeah. I didn't feel like we ate a lot of sugars, but we did eat a lot of fruit and we had to pull back on that because yeah. you've got to, basically you get as much of the sugars out of your diet to, um, so you're not feeding the bad bacteria, you're trying to kill all that off and to reset the gut flora and to get everything very, all your food needs to be really easy to digest, almost like back to baby food mm-hmm. um, with very minimal um ingredients it seems at the start mm. you know meat and a few vegetables and broths yeah lots of bone broths slow cooked bone broths mm. um very healing foods mm. and then you slowly put in eggs to see how you go and then you slowly put in something else so it's very much like a like a um, and like an elimination yeah, diet, like an elimination isn't it? diet. Yeah. and you take your time and and you re- it's amazing you really notice every little change mm. and you know the guys were talking about poo before well my goodness suddenly you've been talking about poo all the yeah. time because everybody has to know any little change I have to know and the kids have got to tell me because if there's a problem they're going to have to move back again or they're going to have to take that ingredient out and try something else so it becomes very um you know you're very focused for the first few months at least mm. you're very focused on everything that goes into your mouth and tell me the impact it had on your son amazing <laughs> um within four months he was standing in front of classes of mine of 200 people speaking about his experience <gasps> oh my goodness not a bit of nervousness um totally back into school zipping ahead with maths He picked up a Rubik's Cube one day and figured it out in two days and now he's down to 12 point something seconds and he just, he's just like maths and physics and science and his brain is firing on all cylinders now. And And the phobias? Phobias are mostly gone. It's very, very slight now and then, not anything major at all. You would never know. Um, Mm. And we've done other things as well as diet. So, you know, there's chiropractic and there's counselling and there's exercise and there's all these other things that we do as well. But um, I really believe the diet has been a very big part of it because mm-hmm. he was the one, when he was a when he was a toddler, if someone gave him ice cream, he'd be constipated for a week, laying in bed just really lethargic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's always been an issue with him that we have to watch what he eats and you don't realise what a difference food can make until you see something like this happen. 
And the sad thing is, you think, in, in a different family, we know without the knowledge, the sort of prognosis and um, expected, you know, how that a, a child like your son might have, how it might have developed, yeah. you know, how he might have been labelled, yeah. you and know, in a normal school. And all the yeah. different things. Like, he is on a tiny bit of medication, but it's not very much. And the doctor said, um, you know, we'll be able to take him off it soon. And the... Mm the counsellor was absolutely amazed at how fast he went through the levels of the counselling just zipping ahead mm. she said and she she understands the diet that we're doing and agrees with it and she was just like yes he's just doing amazingly because of this diet mm. Mm. I think I think one of the most important messages for me in spending time with Joe, um you know as a nutritional therapist as, mm. as you are and too is understanding that from a professional standpoint you can give advice um, and that advice can be received but actually practically putting it mm. into mm. into action mm. and Joe, you know is a really obviously very busy person <laughs> very passionate about food but homeschooling for children mm. and it's been for me inspirational to understand that the, the, the critical part is getting everyone on board and getting yes. everyone involved yes you know the fact that Joe's here mm. and all of her children pretty much are running the household they are because they can do that yeah. and you know that's been the big lesson for me with spending time with you is that you know my kids get in the kitchen they need to get in the kitchen more mm. yeah. yes yeah I, i'm picking that up my, myself as well with two thing. teenagers yeah. yeah if you with when you are changing the way that your family eats you do have to get everyone on board and that was something that was really important and because of the um the drastic you mm. know behavior and everything that had happened um, my other kids were just like if this is going to help our brother we want to do it Oh, that's so, so amazing. They were just devastated that the mm. way that he, you know, everything had gone and they just wanted to help him. And his brother, his older brother is two years older. They're very close. And he was the one that found it the hardest to change the way he, eat, he eats because he wanted his bread and his cheese and everything. But he was willing to do that for his brother. And um, he would always, you know, have his arm around him and encouraging him saying, come on, you can do this. And it was just so gorgeous. And mm. um, that's, they've all pitched in to help because I had, you know, it, it's a lot more work in the kitchen mm. when you're eating as much vegetables as we eat now because every bit of bread and fillers and um, everything is replaced with vegetables mm. now. And so you're chopping vegetables Sometimes it seems like two hours a day of chopping yeah. vegetables. Yeah. And so I'd have to get up an hour earlier in the morning to chop enough vegetables for the day. Yeah. Um, and so the kids all get in and help with that. They know how to cook basic meals and, and some not so basic and snacks and mm -hmm. custards and things that they can have. So even when they go to friends' places now, they take some food with them or the parents of the friends will buy them ingredients and they will cook for themselves at their friends' houses. Wow. So I can trust them to go out and still mm. be able to not to still know that they're going to stick to the diet and they'll be okay because this diet actually goes for two years yeah wow mm. uh, very very interesting let's um, play some music and we'll we'll continue because uh, I want to get into some of the sort of nitty gritty about you know examples of food mm. etc okay. um, so we're going to go up to the news first we'll play another track so um, please stay with us and we'd welcome questions people if you want to get in touch um, and uh, we will be back very shortly on 97.5 FM and online, this is Marlow FM 97.5. And uh, it's the health show, and we're talking to Joe Lawton and Jenny Tishi. Joe, Joe Whitten. Sorry, what did I say? Lawton, <laughs> Joe Whitten, Joe Whitten, and Jenny Tishi. And uh, we're talking about uh, quirky cooking, but it's uh, actually with a very important kind of focus. Um, and it's about healing. It's about healing the gut and the importance of this. And so, um, uh, we, what what I want to do is really get a, a a view of how relevant this is to people listening, because they might think, oh. This is a bit weird <laughs> for people who are really sick and it doesn't really apply to me. So um, let's just pick up the kind of things that families might be dealing with that might m indicate that they would benefit from picking up on some of the um, the sort of concepts that we're talking about. So what sort of typically, uh, what typical symptoms might be that, that mum or dad are exhibiting or that the children are exhibiting where this might be helpful? Hay fever. Yeah. Um, allergies like histamine symptoms um, can be a sign of a leaky gut. Um, also, all the skin issues. So I used to have very, very itchy skin. My legs would 
itch so much that I'd scratch them till they bled. And there was no rash or anything. Mm. You couldn't see anything. But it, if I ate certain things, mm. I would just scratch and scratch and I couldn't sleep at night. Um, but some people come out with rashes and eczema and things like that. Um, circles under the eyes, dark circles under mm. the eyes. Jenny, you'd probably have lots more ideas. Well, but also, I mean, the, the interesting thing, I said I deal with a lot of kids and families, um, but the, the reason that this first came to my attention was because of people on the autistic spectrum. Mm. Mm. And that's really as, as varied and as wide as sort of dyslexia, dyslexia dyspraxia, Asperger's, you know, and, and anywhere really on, on the spectrum that families were showing and exhibiting much mm. better symptoms as a result of working with the GAPS diet. Jo, you wanted to... I forgot to... to say that Isaac was diagnosed with severe OCD, so that's that's where we yeah. are coming okay. from. So mm. we're coming from the gut-brain connection mostly, mm. but we've found that all these other side issues have been helped. So my son stopped snoring, my daughter who had troubles with candida, that's healed up. Um, mostly she's working on all that she had all sorts of funny symptoms that we had gotten tested there was nothing came back Mm. positive nothing was wrong with her but she was having dizzy spells tingling skin around her face she was getting um, swollen around her lips she was having cramps in her arms she was having all these things that um, Mm. we couldn't figure out what they were and that's gone away and tiredness and energy levels tiredness, is a, yes. a, possibly a big one, isn't it? Both in parents and, and in the children. And also skin. I forgot to mention that, like um, mm. acne and... So just, teenage acne. Yeah, yeah, but I'm thinking for me, myself oh, yeah, okay, as well, yeah. like adult acne, just the mm. hormonal stuff. Mm. Um, I've had people who haven't seen me for a while and now after doing gaps for about eight months, nine months, um, they're like, you're glowing. You look yeah. so well. Yeah. <laughs> and so there is a different... Definite mm. difference in your skin. Mm. It's true. You know, actually, obviously, even though we met for the first time when you are in the UK, we've known each other for some time mm. online. online. <laughs> and I definitely say, you know, and I don't mean this in any way, but you do glow. You know, I, I thought you were glowing in your previous pictures, but even more so when I see you in the flesh. You know, mm. it is. It's, your skin is amazing. And, you know, we know that you're jet, well, possibly still slightly jet lagged, a bit tired. You've had a punishing plus. schedule the time you've been here. Um, and yet you carry on sharing, uh, you know, this message, which is amazing. Mm. So it's not just, you know, for those that, um, you know, think there's an extreme situation, but I guess the, the, um, the difficulty is when, if, when we're talking about something like the GAPS diet, the uh, gut and psychology syndrome, Natasha Campbell McBride diet, you, it can, you can Google it. People often need a, you know, a bigger motivation, oh, you know, for things to be it's kind of quite extreme to yeah. be the catalyst to do that. But are there things, are there modifications yes. of that, do you think, that people can yeah. access and do that are perhaps more um, uh, not quite so extreme? Yeah. Yeah. So GAPS was always on my radar because I knew that it was very good for the gut, but I didn't think I needed it. I didn't think any of us did until we had this great big Mm. craziness happen in our lives. But for most people, um, there's little things that you can do to work towards a healthier gut without having to go the whole hog. Yeah. (laughs) So um, bone broths definitely are helpful. Fermented foods. Yes. um, Reducing the grains and acidic kinds of foods in your diet, so grains and dairy and sugar. We most people in our society eat way too much sugar. I think the average is forty teaspoons a day, and that includes in things like the healthy um, juices and mm. yogurts and muesli bars and things like that. It's very easy to add up um, yeah. forty to forty teaspoons of sugar. Whereas in the old days, it was more like four. Yes. Um, and I think that's what the World Health Organization recommends is four. Yeah, for children, they're now recommending four teaspoonfuls a day, which yeah. is 16 grams. And then for adults, between six and nine, depending whether you're female or, or yes. male. But yeah, by comparison to what people are having, they don't realise how realize. far removed we are. And mm. I didn't realise because I thought I was, you know, cooking healthy. But the thing is, I love baking. Mm. And so there was always cakes or biscuits or slice or homemade chocolates or homemade you know, bliss mm, balls cookies. and fudge and, mm. and it was all healthy ingredients and lots of nutrients but even the dates and the honey and everything, they're high in sugar yes. and you can really easily overdo it and doing gaps really brought us back to basics and realised that, hey, maybe I should just bake some little cupcakes or something once a week when we're going somewhere and we need to take something. You know, it's mm. not something you need every day. Yes. Um, so starting to pull back on those sorts of things and getting kids eating veggie sticks and dip for a snack or, Mm. um, you know, only 
not not overdoing it with the fruit. My son was so worried about he's he's 15 and he's very tall and thin and he was worried about gaining weight. So he he was eating like six bananas a day, and that in in Queensland our bananas are big. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I had to really pull him back on that because one mm-hmm. of the things we noticed with gaps is whenever he upped his fruit um, intake, his um, hay fever and sinus problems came back. Yeah. And I always thought that was related to gluten or dairy, but it was also the sugars. So um, just things like mm. be, being more aware of how much sugars your kids are having. And so um, how how are you sharing this information with the world and how are you doing that? Because we'd all love to know more. Okay, I have a podcast in Australia. Well, obviously it's worldwide mm. <laughs> um, on iTunes and it's called A Quirky Journey. Um, and that goes through... My friend and I started that together um, because she's been on GAPS for years with her family. She has autistic children and um, the difference that it's made for her is amazing. And we've gone through our journeys and we interview people and talk about, um, you know, how gut health affects women's hormones and how... um, how to change your house around so that you're getting rid of toxins and chemicals in the home, how mm. to get a good water filter, all sorts of really practical stuff and inspirational interviews. So that's a quirky journey. Um, and then I also have my blog, which is Quirky Cooking. And Facebook page is very active where I every day I'll be posting pictures of things I'm eating, how to make them that may not be a proper recipe, but just this is mm. what I'm having for breakfast because people get overwhelmed and stuck in a rut, like I said earlier, and don't know what to do just for the basic, quick, everyday stuff. Mm. And um, it might not look, seem like very much to someone who knows how to cook really well, but people that are not very confident in the kitchen need those little bits of help. So I do meal plans most weeks and put them up on Facebook. Um, I also have... And you're writing a book or you've written a book? I've written one book and it was more my journey before GAPS, but there's still heaps of recipes in there that you can use, um, just learn to tweak them a little bit for GAPS. And I do use my book a lot. (laughs) Um, But I'm also working on a program to help people with getting started to heal their gut and just for healthy eating, whole foods, and that'll have a book with it as well. Fantastic. When do you think that will be available? I don't know. (laughs) Because we all want it. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> and what's what's uh, very interesting, I find, is, you know, as a mother, but also as a nutrition practitioner, is that, you know, you use the word journey, but it is feels like that, doesn't it? Mm. You know, you think you kind of know what you need to know. Mm. And then and you go over and the then, top of a hill and go, oh, oh there's a whole <laughs> no, another world over there. I and, had no idea. Yeah. And there may well be other kind of worlds there That's that right. we don't yet That's know right. and we haven't discovered. But yeah. I think that, again, with that, it's really, Jo says when she's presenting, she says, you know, just think back five years, think back mm. 10 years. How much has your diet changed? And for most people in the room, they're there because they are trying to make better choices. And you do reflect and you think, yeah, it's changed. So kind of almost like well done because you've done well. And don't beat yourself up for not doing the best you can. Yes. But I think, as I said earlier, you know, if there's that disconnect between what you're being given as advice and the reality of putting it into place, then it it does make it really hard. Mm. And I think what we're very guilty of doing um, is comparing ourselves to others. I mean, gosh, Mm. I remember years ago people saying, oh, she can eat that cake and I I can't. I mean, as soon as I eat that cake, you know, I put on pounds. And I sort of think we are so guilty of comparing ourselves mm-hmm. directly to other people. We are all individuals mm. and we've got to work out what works best for our bodies. Right. And whilst you don't want to be preparing different meals for every single family member, you do need to consider the needs of each. And great that your kids have all come on board. Mm. Yes, actually, they're going to benefit from it too, which is an amazing added bonus. But the fact was they all united to try and help yeah. a member of the family. And if you can try and make that the mm. focus and mm. then having family members, Meals, getting the kids yes. involved uh, it just seems to me that that sort of going back to basics yes, you know going yeah. back to real food and real cooking and actually do you know what we don't need all this stuff on the shelves we mm. don't need all these packets I'm amazed I go into the grocery store and I pretty much go to the veggie and fruit section and the meat section and I do buy yogurt sometimes just plain yogurt mm. um, the really good stuff but other than that it's really you know, it's a no-go zone, isn't it? I on don't the rest need of it. all those 
mm. packets and tins mm. and bits and pieces. Mm. It's very basic. So what I would like to do is um, we'll take another song, but I'd like to talk about some practicalities because I know there's some bits of kitchen gadgetry um, that's made <laughs> life easier. Um, and maybe just a few practical ideas. For example, breakfast and snacks, I think people are the, they're the things that people find sure. probably the hardest yeah. to be creative about or think of alternatives. Yes. So let's play a track and then we'll come back and uh, pick up those practicalities. So we're talking practicalities now. So we're saying, okay, what are we actually talking about? You know, because <laughs> there'll be some listeners thinking, well, bone broth, yes, but, but what else? What else? You can't live on that. What other things can you do? And uh, is it going to take me all day? And how do I do it? So a good example would be, let's say, what, what options would there be for breakfast? Because we're taking out all the cereals, aren't we? Yes, we yeah. are. Um, you have to start thinking dinner for breakfast, yeah. You really need a good meal for breakfast to keep going for the day. And I know for some people that's that's a sort of a hard thing to think of, um, especially if they're not used to eating a big breakfast. I was raised eating a big breakfast, so I'm fine. Um, <laughs> so when you're first starting off with gaps, you can't actually have eggs, which was mm. very hard for us because we always have had eggs for breakfast. Um, but you can have... So you're supposed to have broths, obviously, mm. about a cup every meal. You can you can mix that into soups, stews, whatever. But one thing that we absolutely love for breakfast is I, I call it a bit of a, a broth bar, you know, like a salad bar. Mm. <laughs> so what I'll do is I've always got a broth cooking, sometimes two cooking. So you've got your chicken bones and your, your or carcass, and you've got, or you've got your beef bones, and it's all simmering with veggies and a bit of vinegar to get the minerals out of the bones. Um, and in the morning I'll get up, and that's quite reduced and condensed and nice because it's been cooking all night. I'll dip some of that out into a smaller pan on the stove and um, chuck in some grated carrot, courgette, um, onion, shallots, freshly minced garlic, whatever you've got, some kale, um, bok choy, yeah. whatever. Just throw in some veggies. And this is why I call it the, the broth bar because I'll often do all those things separately on the side counter and everyone can put in what they want into their broth. Nice. Um, and then once that's simmered and it's and the veggies are tender, I'll put in, um, if you have leftover meat, chuck some of that in mm. or there's sometimes meat from the bones in the broth. Um, and then I'll crack in some eggs, whoever wants eggs, and then put the lid on and the eggs poach in the broth with vegetables. Mm. And then I'll scoop that, make them nice and soft so you've got runny eggs. If you don't like runny eggs, you can keep them cooking, obviously. Um, and then scoop that into the bowls and then I'll put in a couple of pit, bits of avocado, a couple of spoonfuls of sauerkraut just next to it, and that'll be breakfast. Mm. So it's like a soup. We, we'd kind of yeah, think of it as a soup, like wouldn't a soup, we? Yeah, but with eggs. It's very and tasty. And so that... Mm. It's not very soupy by the time you get all that stuff in it. So if, you, if you're not really into soup, you can make it quite like a meal mm. if you want to you can just drink a cup of broth mm. and have something else like you might want to make a smoothie um you might want to if you can if you're up to eggs mm. some scrambled eggs um we'll, we often have um local nitrate free bacon that we chop up and fry up and add to the eggs um so that sort of thing mm. is really delicious for breakfast and i do say for people who can't handle all that kind of stuff if they're at the stage of gaps where they can handle or if they're not really doing gaps, they're just trying to eat mm. healthier, a really good nutritious smoothie where you've got protein and fats and carbs in that smoothie so it will keep you going for a long time. So I put avocado in the yeah. smoothies. I put frozen bananas to make it really creamy. I use nuts as a base, so soak some mm. cashews or almonds. Um, coconut water or water. Um, you, you might want to put in some spinach or baby spinach or or um, cos lettuce or something mm. like that. Um, you can chuck in a raw egg if you want extra protein. Yeah. Um, coconut cream, coconut oil, chia seeds if you want it really thick, berries. So I have lots of ideas on mm. my website and also in my book. Um, but that, for people that just want to have a healthier breakfast but are not really into a full meal, that's a really easy breakfast and you can make a whole heap and take some with you when mm. you go off to work or school. Mm. I take it on the plane when I travel. Great. Smoothie. <laughs> Except <laughs> overseas because you can only take 100 mils. <laughs> and, uh, and it's quick to do. Very quick. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Mm. Great. And then in terms of um, labour de- saving devices, I yes. know you do use <laughs> a particular one that yes. helps you, but the slow stuff, the bone broth, obviously mm-hmm. you're having uh, in a pot or in a, you know, just cooking. For, and typically how long do you cook your bone broths for? Chicken broth, usually I do for about 12 to 48 hours, depending on like, if, if I want to use it straight away. Yeah. I'll, I mean, like straight away, like 12 hours. Mm. <laughs> I'll um, dip some out and use it, but then I'll just top up the pot and keep cooking. So you can keep using those bones and adding more veggies. It's called a perpetual broth. You just keep adding to it, Mm. taking some out when you need it, then adding more water straight away so that the bones are always covered um, and adding a few more veggies, a bit more vinegar. And, And you can cook it until the bones are sort of squishy and mushy. And wow. then you strain it all off and start again. Same with beef. You use your marrow bones, some meat bones, some knuckle bones, so that you've got the flavour as well as the gelatin mm. and the goodness from the marrow. Um, and that will last a lot longer. You can go 48 or longer hours because you've got really heavy bones. So yes. once they start to break down, you'd start over. Mm. But you can keep like scooping off the broth and using it in meals and to drink. Mm. And every time you've finished a meal, then you just top up the broth again. And do you know, this veggies. is probably what our grandparents did, oh, isn't it? Is. You know, the interesting thing is, um, my mum always tells me this story, that when her mother was uh, younger, she was training to be one of the first health visitors in South Wales, going into the poor oh, okay. South Wales mining villages mm. when mining was starting to cease to exist mm. and, and she needed to go in and help. And she was taken to London to, to do her training. And the, th- the one thing that my mum remembers being told by her mother was that she had to be able to show families how to make a broth mm-hmm. from a fish head yes. because fish heads were going to be discarded by the fishmonger they were about the cheapest if they cost anything thing you could get yep. and so putting the bones and the head and the parts of the fish that people weren't going to eat into a broth was how we were teaching then how we were teaching people that didn't have sufficient funds to be able to you know eat healthily to eat healthily wow and that's, that's amazing all yeah. that time yeah. ago yeah. and we've come full circle we we're have. now using broths again yeah. and you my know. mum always you know when you finished having a roast chicken all the bones went into the pot mm. you make the broth and any gravy or leftover veggies all went into the pot and that would simmer all night and then you make a soup from that so I was raised doing that it doesn't seem weird to me mm. but mm. a lot of people are just like what what how do you do this so I have made a um on my on my website there's a whole blog post on broth there's a video on it there's a oh, podcast great. on it because people just have so many questions about it's broth. true it's true it's yeah. very simple but mm. yeah when it's new to you I guess you know well just knowing how long to cook yeah. them for because I was cooking mine mm. for about six or eight hours thinking that was quite a long time. And then where to source the bones from? Because yes. I know particularly in this country people have That's an issue right. about beef bones and yeah. sort of about cow disease so you need to be careful about where you're... Is there anywhere locally, Jane, um, There's know? somewhere online um, there? yeah. which I know um, other people in Marlow are using to get sourced mm. and, and get delivered to them to use mm. and they're sort of trusted bones. Obviously chicken bones. I was going to ask, can you do it with fish bones? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Fish, lamb. Because if you're anything. a sort of pescatarian and you yeah. didn't want to eat the meat versions then that would be a way to and there is even uh, a way to add eggshells for calcium right um you can also do there is a vegan version Mm. obviously not quite as much um, nutrients in that one but you can put in different mushrooms and sea vegetables and things to do a vegetable broth that is very nutritious yeah Mm. um it's different in that it doesn't have the gelatine obviously which um we really like to have in our broths because it heals the gut lining Mm. is it is it do you think it is the collagen the gelatine it's the glutamine isn't it in in the bones i think which is calming Yeah. 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 yeah Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and so um, so we're talking about the slow cooking, but then you use um, the thermomix, don't yeah. you, for other things. So tell us a bit more about that. So I have both going at mm. most times in my house. Um, so I've got the slow stuff going and then the quick stuff is done in the thermomix. So um, anytime I want to make a mash, like a cauliflower leek mash, because we don't have potatoes um, or... Um, steam veggies or I do those two things at once in the thermix got the mash in the bottom and the veggie steam on top maybe some fish on top of that if you want a quick meal um, I do things like uh, making all your sauces mm. aioli um you know, the kids still want to have a little bit of things that they're used to, like tomato sauce. You can make that all from scratch, and it's not that hard, especially with thermix. You just chuck it all in, cook it for 40 minutes, and whiz it up. It's no, It chops mm. it all for you. It blends it all for you. You wouldn't... There's no skin seeds or anything left. You don't have to blanch tomatoes mm. or anything. Mm. Um, and 
gravies. So when I finish, I make a roast. I'll put lots of veggies and onion and garlic in the bottom, put the meat on top um, and what, lots of water in and cook it in the oven. And then I'll tip all the, um, the juices with the onion and garlic into mm. the thermomix and add gelatine and um, a little bit of salt or stock paste, which I make myself in the thermomix, and cook that in there. And then that's your gravy. Wow. Blend it up. With no flour thickener, because no, no, I got stuck. Right. I thickened a gravy on Sunday with uh, a bit of cauliflower mash. Yes, that works beautifully. How do you make it? How do you get the colour of the gravy? Um, it just it does from, look a little bit different. Yeah. Like it doesn't have that as mm. brown a colour, but mm. it tastes divine. Yeah. And the cauliflower mash, um, I use a lot, like you're saying, um, to thicken soups and make them creamy. Mm. I make a white sauce out of cauliflower mash with the leek and the um, chicken broth in it, or when you get to the stage where you can have coconut cream, that's delicious added in there. Mm. I make the coconut creams and milks and nut milks and creams in the thermix, make so the yogurts in there. Just talk me through how you'd make a coconut milk. Okay, so 300 grams of desiccated coconut, no preservatives, in the thermix. It's very cheap to buy. You can get it mm. at the health food shops or I buy it in bulk. Um, blend that up for a few seconds and then add 800 grams of water. Blend that up for one minute on high speed. Squeeze that really well through a nut milk bag um, and then um, put the pulp aside and use that again for another lot of milk. So 500 grams of water in with that pulp makes another lot of milk that'll be just a little bit thinner. Um, so that first thick mm. lot of milk you can make into cream by emulsifying melted coconut oil into that. And so you're just basically blending it um, mm. while you drizzle in the coconut oil in the top of the lid. And then you've set that in the fridge. It'll set and it'll divide into two layers. It'll have the thick yeah. oily cream on top and the liquid on the bottom. Once it's set firm, you put it back in the thermomix, chop it all up and blend it again, and then you've got a thick cream, like a pouring cream. Mm. If you want to make it really thick, you can add, If you, I don't think you can if you're on gaps, but for other people, um, you can add a tiny bit of xanthan gum and it will make it like a whipped cream. Okay. Wow. Um, and then you can use the pulp that's left over, dehydrate that either in a dehydrator or in an oven on really low heat on the, in trays in the oven. Once it's really, really dry, put it back in the thermix, blend it up and you've got coconut flour. So you haven't wasted any of That's that. That's amazing. And Isn't it? you mm. know how much tins of organic coconut oh, cream absolutely. cost. Yeah, huge amounts. And like you were saying earlier, they've got gums in them, yeah. which you can't have on yeah. gaps. So if you're making your own, you can know you, exactly what's in it. You couldn't it's actually cheaper. really do that without a Thermomix very easily, could you? It would be, it would be harder. It would, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, mm. Thermomix goes up to 10,000 something, 10,700 or something revs per minute. So it's very powerful. Mm. Um, you'd have to have a a really powerful blender. Mm. You might do it in a Vitamix, yeah, actually, the it. blending bit. Yeah. But The heating in the Thermomix is very specific, which I love. So you can set your... Um, so when I emulsify the coconut oil in, I set it at 50 degrees mm -hmm. and emulsify that in. Oh, and another thing, you can make your own chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, really? Yeah. Using so, um, some very pure ingredients, Very of pure ingredients. So um, once we got to this, like we were off chocolate for maybe six months, we couldn't have any cocoa at all. And that's like, whoa. But um, once we got to the stage where we could have some, I made it with a low amount of cacao powder so that it wasn't, overwhelming and very low sweeteners and used honey so cacao butter cacao powder pure raw honey um, you know all organic mm. ingredients a little bit of salt a little bit of vanilla powder or vanilla bean um, mm. or um, you can get really pure vanilla extract that doesn't have alcohol or sugar um, and then you can put in some spices you can some I put, I goji like, berries yeah. maybe what I like to do is make my own trail mix with um, so I soak and dehydrate the nuts so they're all crispy and easy to digest seeds um, same thing all different dried fruits that are you know, you get the good quality stuff, buy it in bulk, make it yourself, make up a big trail mix and I put that in the bottom of a pan so it's a couple of centimetres high, pour the chocolate over that, mix it all in and press it down and then put it in the freezer and then cut it into bars and that's my my chocolate energy mm. bars. Yeah, Sounds absolutely <laughs> scrummy. It's a shame Australia's so far away. because uh, I have be... one in my handbag. <laughs> Speak nicely to me. I might let you have a taste. <laughs> Here's one I prepared early. So did you come I, over with a suitcase full, packed prepared. full of food? I have, I have my macadamia nuts because I know they're expensive here and I mm. live on them at home. Whenever I'm 
really rushed and I need to take food with me, I'll grab macadamia nuts and a banana. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I've got my little chocolate energy bars. I always have an avocado with me wherever I go and a spoon in my handbag. Yeah. My hand, my friend calls my handbag the TARDIS because you're just constantly pulling things out of it. Yeah. Um, so I usually have a boiled egg on hand somewhere with a little container of salt. I take my little container of honey with me so that I can have it. If I want to go out for a coffee with a friend, which I'm up to the stage where I can have a little bit of coffee, um, I'll have a just a, you know a black, a black americano a mm. little bit of honey in it and um and everywhere I, you've stayed you, I, here, whilst you've been here she sort of just takes the food forward yes each yeah. time so yeah nick a bit from the last place yeah. Yeah. leave a bit behind place, and then yeah. go for exchange <laughs> my seed crackers oh take yes them with me so i've got my avocado and my seed crackers yeah yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, I'm interested to know what the longer term picture looks like, Joe. So mm -hmm. you, you're, you and your family are on a program and, um, you know, you're gradually sort of expanding your horizons and mm -hmm. introducing more and more things um, as and when, you know, each of you can tolerate it. And I guess moving back a step if it doesn't work and then yeah. continuing that process. And the whole thing is designed so that, you know, your digestive system, your gut is totally healed mm -hmm. um, and you've already said it you know it could be a two-year process yeah um and um you know some might think okay well when i get to you know the end of that then i can eat and drink whatever i like <laughs> not <laughs> but, necessarily no but what's kind of the end game you know where okay. would you like to get to with your family and the way you you guys are eating one thing i'm finding um so encouraging with gaps is that the kids tastes are changing and mine mm. and we're realising that we were having way too much sugar before and they will, like my eldest was very addicted to sugar. Mm. Even though it was healthy sugars, it was still sugar. And she now will have something that's got a bit of honey in it and she'll just go, oh, that's too sweet for me. I need to, you mm. know, reduce the honey in that. Um, and it's really good to hear that because it never would have happened before. So I think even though we can bring some things back in towards the end of the two years, I hope that we won't go back to the way we were because we could end up in the same boat again. Yes. Um, I'm pretty sure we won't go back to doing all of mm. that again. We'll, we'd be, we will be much more aware of what's going into our bodies and how we feel um, and tweak it as we go. I think we'll hopefully be able to have a little bit of rice, a little bit of buckwheat and quinoa and things like that, bring mm. those back in a little bit. Maybe not over, you know... Not every meal, mm. obviously. Mm. Um, keeping the baking at a minimum and the sugars at a minimum. But um, there's some things that may not ever be able to be brought back in. Some people find that, like my friend who's been doing gaps for about three and a half years, her kids cannot cope with very much fruit at all. They're autistic and they, mm. their behaviour totally goes backwards if they have more than a handful or two of fruit a day. Wow. Um, also, legumes are a really big issue for them. We've started bringing legumes back in, just mm. the few that you can have on gaps. Yeah, so lentils are generally... Yeah, lentils and the soft white beans. Yeah. And so we've been okay with that so far. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's things like that. You have to be aware that you may not have as much as you used to. I was raised, my parents are from Texas and um, I was raised Tex-Mex food, you know, all the oh, beans yeah, of course. and the yeah. cheese and all that. And I just, I probably won't be able to go back to that like I was before. Mm. Mm. Um, I actually can't handle any dairy at all yet. I can't even handle ghee Mm. So, which is very disappointing for me because I love ghee and butter. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, I would slather it on everything if I could. Mm. Um, but my kids can handle it now, but I can't. Mm. So it's different, like you were saying earlier, it's different for everybody and it can be different in the family. Yes. And it, I think it's just made us a lot more aware of listening to our bodies. And what do you think, what do you hope for your teenagers as they you know move off and go, go go into independence especially if they go mm. off to uni and, yes. and start living independently yeah I really want them to be able to um, be aware of what food how how they react to mm. foods or how they you know what re their relationship with food I want to be very good I want and I think they will keep that because they are very um, aware of what's in what they're eating now, they ask. Mm. And, you know, when they're not with me, they do generally um, check into it, mm. make sure that they're eating good food. Um, and I know that as kids grow up and leave home, they'd probably get a bit slacker than they were with mum. Mm. But I still think we're instilling the values and the, uh, the knowledge for them to 
be able to make good decisions mm. with, with food mm. and they know how to cook mm. and they know how to buy the food and they know I'm hoping that they're going to know how to grow it because we are working on a garden now. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah. That's great. And I, I think the other thing is that... Um, Yes, they might. You know, it, the hard thing I think, when when you've got a family unit together and, and you know you're uh, supporting and managing it and kind of leading the way and they're experiencing the benefits. That's all great. When they go off um, independently, I think. Um, the experience they might have of, you know, being the different one, mm. you know, if they're in a shared kitchen environment yep. at uni or something, my mm-hmm. daughter's about to go off to uni later in the year and that's, I guess, what she's going to experience. Yes. And they're all doing their pot noodles or, you yes. know, <laughs> whatever, you know, the, um, you know, boxed pizzas and frozen mm-hmm. pizzas and things. And um, it's having the confidence, isn't it? Yes. And having the strength and of character to kind of do something different in that right. environment. And I've seen in the last few months, my, ki- my kids have grown in leaps and bounds in that area, that they are not afraid to be a bit different. Mm. They take their little thermos of stew to soccer or whatever and eat it and don't care. Um, and... And we've gotten to the stage now that their friends will come to our house and say, this food is delicious. I wish I was on GAPS. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, well, just so you realise, you can't actually have lots of sugary sweets. And they're like, oh. <laughs> but they love the meals and they love what we're eating and they want the recipes. And, they, and a lot of their friends are going home and making the recipes. And um, I'm finding that it's not actually as hard as we thought it would be mm. um, because when people realise how delicious... I mean, slow-cooked meat and veggies, you can't go wrong. It's so no. delicious. Yeah. Um, and you put in lots of fresh herbs and you get the spices in there and you make mm. the flavours amazing. No one's going to complain about that. No. It's just real good old-fashioned food. Mm. Um, mm. And I think most of the time if kids went off to uni and they're doing the shared kitchen thing, I think more than anything everyone would be asking them to cook for them. <laughs> yeah. They'd be stealing their bone broth out of the fridge, wouldn't That's they? Right. Or well, Isaac, my 13-year-old, he's so funny. He's, ever since he was, you know, years ago, he started cooking and he was like, I've got to learn to cook so I can cook for my wife one day. She might not be as healthy as me, so I have to be able to do it. Oh, that's so sweet. It's very sweet. Yeah. I think that's a great gift, actually, isn't it, to give to the children? Yeah. And, and the spe- especially the thing that, you know, you don't have to be the same as everyone else. And yeah, actually, and that's okay. Yeah, and you can have a positive impact on, mm-hmm. on your friends and family around you, the other friends around you. Um, and for them to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. Mm. Actually, that's that's, probably helpful, isn't it? That's exactly it. If they don't know why, they're not going to keep it up. Yeah. And um, my kids, especially Isaac, he's really researched it for himself, gone online and read up on things and Mm. read me things. And um, when we were at the start of GAPS, he was the one that knew exactly what stage we were on at all times and what you could eat on that stage. And if I couldn't remember, I'd ask him because he knew. Wow. And um, he'd always keep an eye on the other kids and say, no, no, you can't have that yet. You haven't mm. you haven't put this in yet. You've got to put that in first. And <laughs> so he was always on track. Yeah. And um, I think with the others, they've, they're a bit a step behind him because it hasn't been quite as important to them, mm. I suppose. But they've definitely learnt heaps and I think they'll keep that with them. Mm, they will. And have they had experience during that, the, the eight or nine months where... They've either by mistake or just by um, circumstance, you know, they've eaten something that mm. that wasn't planned yes. and they've had a, an, a reaction or they've noticed something. We had, a, um, we had afternoon tea with some friends who didn't quite understand the diet and they made a tart that had some spelt flour in it just to thicken the, the date paste. And um, we were halfway through it before we realised but we were, let's see, maybe six months down the track by mm. then. And I thought, well, this will be interesting to see how much our gut has healed. Because I know for me, I would have usually broken out in very, very itchy legs mm. and nothing happened. Okay. And I was really encouraged by that. That, And the kids were really encouraged too that, um, see, this is working. Mm. And it doesn't mean that you will never be able to eat any of these foods forever. Mm. If you have a little bit here and there, you know, if you go overseas and you want to have a croissant in France, mm. you'll probably survive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because your gut will be able to handle a bit yeah. of that. You just can't do it all the time. Mm. Mm. Um, and it doesn't mean to say that they'll completely kind of um, regress back. And have you to know. start again. Yeah. That was their biggest worry. Yes. That they would have to start again if they ate anything wrong. Yes. And hopefully the further we get along, you know... The more resilient they will be. A bit more flexibility, Mm. um, Mm. although we'll stick to the diet as much as we can. Mm. But we have had a couple of 
you know, setbacks, mm. just little ones where mm. we've had to go, okay, we're having too much fruit, we're reacting, mm. we have to go back and cut back on that or, yeah. um, you know... At first, with the chocolate, I must admit, I overdid it. Mm. <laughs> and we had to cut back on that for a while and not have any. So it's just, um, yeah, just figuring it out as you go along. Mm. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. So um, any kind of words of encouragement finally then? We're just coming up to the, yeah. the last few minutes. Any words of encouragement to people who think, you know, think listening to what we talked about with regard to symptoms, that there are things that, you know, we could... We, mothers might be thinking that they could do to improve um, you know the health and um, long term gut health of their families any words of encouragement if they feel daunted by the prospect start with um, a few little things don't try to jump in like like I did both mm. feet all mm. at once the next day um, I do talk about this on my podcast if you go back to the very first one how to begin Okay. because I think um, it can be very very overwhelming for me it wasn't so bad it was like oh yes a challenge because yeah. I love making up recipes yeah. but for other people it's like oh my goodness you know, mm. this is totally different. I was already having broths. I was already having fermented foods. I was eating mostly grain-free, dairy-free and very low sugars. So for me to work back to the intro mm. stage of GAPS wasn't a big deal. But for other people, you might want to start by um, cutting out gluten mm. and having less breads in your life mm. <laughs> and cereals and pastas and slowly working back. So um, you might have a gluten-free pasta, which you mix with zucchini slices or noodles. You know, you make mm. the zucchini strips. Or courgette, as oh, we sorry, call it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you um, mix that in and then you put the spaghetti bolognese sauce homemade on there and the kids will probably not mind because, mm. but you're slowly cutting back the pasta. So do things bit by bit with your family so you don't freak everyone out. Mm. Um, and I have heaps of ideas for that sort of thing on my Facebook page and blog and in my news letters also which you can subscribe to through my blog um, I answer readers questions in there mm. and I think if you don't if you t as, as long as it's not drastic like we had we had to start quickly but if you are just trying to improve your family's health um, you can start substituting ingredients to make them more nourishing and less fillers in your diet and more nutrient dense foods mm. um, in a way that won't freak the family out yeah, and introducing the concept of bone broth is a great yeah. way as well because you're sometimes when people look at these things they they think about all the things that they're going to have to cut out. Mm. But if you're putting something in, yes, um, and you know something new in, and find that actually it's nice and you can yes. use the bone broth in so many different ways as as the base for soups, etc. Then it can um, and and I've seen um, amazing. Amazing improvements just from using bone broth. Yes, bone broths and fermented veggies. If you yeah. add those two things into mm. your diet bit by bit, mm. um, you'll see amazing differences just mm. with that. And as Jenny was saying to me yesterday, um, the more good things you put in, the more bad things are naturally going to be crowded out yeah. without you even trying. Yeah. So just keep working on getting the good things in and the kids won't be so hungry for the chips and the chocolate and the lollies and, mm. sorry, sweets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> You're doing a bit of a translation yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's true. It's true. And uh, the idea that we can absolutely, our tastes and our palates really totally do change, change quite yeah. quickly, actually. They do. It's very quick. Mm. Uh, and the first week or so of, um, you know, reducing some of those things are probably the hardest. hardest yeah. Um, but once you get over that, then actually, you know, it's... Um, it's easier. It is much, much easier. Mm. Okay, so thank you so much, Jo. I know you've got to go off to London to your next uh, event. Yeah. And um, how long are you here for? Um, it's been over two weeks altogether. Yeah. Um, I leave on Saturday. Okay, so have a great rest of your trip. Thank you very much for fitting us in. And uh, we've been talking to Jo from Quirky Cooking. What's the name of your website? Quirkycooking.com.au. Dot com dot au. Okay, thank you very much. It's thank been our you. pleasure. That's the end of this show. And I thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And please give us any feedback you'd like to, um, qu questions, comments on my Facebook page or in the Quirky Cooking chat group. Also on the website, thewellnesscouch.com backslash a quirky journey. You can leave a comment or question there. 
and we'd love it if you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Also, check out thewellnesscouch.com where you can view the entire range of wellness podcasts available. There's heaps of them now and there's so many good ones. So I'll see you again next week and we'll be back to our usual program with Leah, my health coach and fellow podcaster. Um, And we have some great interviews coming up, so don't miss those. I'll see you soon. Bye. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.